Aloha, and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. I'm right here next to St. Augustine's Catholic Church. In fact, the radio studio is basically almost just above the altar. Our condo is 25 floors above the altar at St. Augustine's Church. If you're ever coming to Waikiki Beach, go to our website, deepadventure.com, and, and do the connect with us. Connect with Bear. Send us a little text, maybe we can have, a, or an email, maybe we can have uh, coffee together. We have a great guest with us, a returning guest, which we don't do very often, and that is with our guest, Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're going to talk about a great new book, A Year with the Popes. It's not what you might think it might be. It's, it's a great new book. Looking forward to talking with our guests. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, my wife always like, likes me to start the radio show off with the sign of the cross in Hawaiian. Ake makua, ke keiki, ame ke ohana, hemalele, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to uh, have your, word, your words go forth. Um, you know, my new book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, has been doing really good. In fact, it's been uh, hitting up in the top 10 for all Christian men's books. So we think it's something that's really valuable for you to give to... Uh, to women, give them to your husbands, your brothers, your sons, and give them to your non-Christian friends. A lot of them, I mean, non-Catholic friends. A lot of them love the book, and especially those those confused younger men that are that are really have a confusion about what it means to be a man, wh whether they have faith or not. It's a kind of a book that speaks their language, uh, speaks in the <laughs> speaks the way men speak to other men, and uh, so it, we. I'm going to read an excerpt from the book to give you a flavor for it uh, right now. Uh, it's based on cowboys. And uh, this is the chapter, All My Heroes Were Cowboys. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of Louis L'Amour Westerns, too, by the way. I got to use a lot of his quotes. I got to talk to his wife uh, to get permission to use his quotes. And he was a great Western novelist. Uh, his heroes were all, all seeking to be virtuous. And what's really cool is the women in his books were all very strong women, although they did find themselves in vulnerable places. That's why the hero rides in to save the day. But here's an excerpt from the book. Uh, cowboys were men who put others first, who rode for the brand, who got the job done come hell or high water. They persevered and kept fighting even when wounded. They were as dangerous as a rattlesnake or a cornered mountain lion. They were not to be taken lightly. Every man's heart comes factory loaded with a call to heroic virtue, to champion a cause that is greater than he is, and so he reaches out to a God that is greater than him to fulfill the quest. He rides high in the saddle of his principles and dreams. He cowboys up. So that's, that's the kind of man that the world needs today. And women, wherever we go, women come up to Cindy and I, tell the men we need for them to be men again. And so uh, the book is 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? If you go to our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure YouTube channel, um, my sons have put together these 60 second shorts that everyone loves on YouTube so much. You can click those and share those in social media. And uh, they really have a great impact because they're, they're, they, they're AI generated. So they kind of have that new look that the younger generation loves. Uh, but every generation can, every generation of man, whether you're in Europe or Australia or wherever you are, we, all men love cowboys. So uh, we encourage you to to get the book and go to the YouTube channel and share that share those we have a, with our guest today father Jeffrey Kirby uh, he is the he is the pastor as Our Lady of Grace Parish in Indian Land South Carolina and is an adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey College author of many many books uh, he's 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 was uh, I think born in Texas raised in South Carolina and 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 Germany has traveled the world, and uh, just a real thrill to have you back with us. We don't often have returning guests, but we love having you back with us, Father Kirby. Aloha. Aloha, Bear. It's good to be with you. Thank hey, you. Great to be with you, too. Uh, you know, I, w I just want to get right into this subject of this of this book. Uh, don't you love tan books, what they do with their books? Don't you just love it? Like, they Beautiful. have to become part of your permanent library, you know, the... Yeah. A Year with the Popes. It, this is not what I expected it to be. I was thinking it would be... 
a page with a, a long a long writing from one of the popes that I could barely understand, you know, and then you would translate it. But it really is unique because as you re- read through the book, you're kind of walking along with that pope, uh, and, and you and you go through uh, the early church and then all the way up into uh, up up into even contemporary times. Can can you tell us what uh, why you felt why you were inspired to read this book, write this book? Yes, yes. So it's interesting because the uh, the first proposal to to Tam Books was actually a year with John Paul II. So I really just wanted to to dive into the writings of of Pope Saint John Paul II. And and as the conversation you know occurred with the with the publisher and myself and the team and so on, they said, well, how about we we broaden it and just make it a year with the popes? And and, and that made sense. And so we we decided, okay, we're going to broaden this. But but you'll notice that the book is actually dedicated. Uh, to Pope St. John Paul II, and, and the latter part of the book, there's a substantial part that covers the teachings of John Paul II, who's mm-hmm. the second longest pope in the history of the Church, and so he rightly merits that place. And But in terms of where the idea came from, I, I, I originally wanted to, to kind of just develop a lot of the teachings of, of John Paul II, and then when the project was brought in, I thought, okay, this is an opportunity uh, to go a lot deeper, a lot broader than what I originally was thinking, but I thought it was great, it's a good challenge. And as you've said, Bear, I wanted to present from the very beginnings the biblical foundation, the central place of the papacy and the Christian way of life, and, and really just allow it to be apologetics, catechetics, devotion, so someone can have one day, because every day is just one page, can have eight to ten minutes of prayer, fifteen if they want to go longer, but allowed to be a time of prayer, but also concurrently learning about our faith and understanding some of the arguments that we can use in, in terms of conversation with, with neighbors and co-workers. So I really, I'm glad you picked up on that because I, that was really the vision of the book. I mean, you, you recall like the, the first few days are actually from the Old Testament. And mm-hmm. I go all the way back mm-hmm. to the prophecies and, mm-hmm. and just want to use this as an opportunity because we all know Bear, we're busy. Everyone's busy. So if you're going to give 10, 15 minutes for prayer, uh, we're at a point now we've got to double up. It's prayer and formation. <laughs> hey, well said. So well said. And you know, even the Catechism says that it's meant for contemplative prayer, that you should contemplate it, not just breeze through it. But you know, what I like, in the back of the book, you have the bibliography, and you have Warren Carroll's Christendom, which I love. I have all those books back here. And then George Weigel, there's your, there's your John Paul II. But you, you put those two series of books together. Uh, wouldn't it be great if everybody had the time to read through all those books? But oh, what yes. you do is you, but you're, you're, you've lifted out of those, Warren Carroll's, I think, seven volumes or something. I love those yeah. books. Yeah. A- a- everyone should try to plow through those if you, if, you're, if you love history. People ask me, so do you love, uh, I, I, they go, I really love history. And I go, what do you like to study? Oh, World War II or the Civil War. And those are great things. But I like to, I like to if, you, if you follow the history of the church or the history of Western civilization, you are going through the history of the church. Of course, not just Western civilization as the church branched out. But uh, so then can I ask you to start with a real s- simple question? Because I love it when we have our non-Catholic friends listen to this show. And the first thing they're gonna ask about the Pope, and I'm sure you kind of talk about that in here. I didn't re- haven't read the whole book because I'm gonna read it one page at a time, as suggested. Right. Well, what, what, do we, what does the church mean when we say uh, infallibility? That's, that's the big question. Yeah, so, so right away we should make the distinction that infallibility doesn't mean that the Pope is, is without sin, that he's, you know, somehow, you know, has indefectibility, so he's without sin. We don't mean mm. that at all. Mm. Uh, nor do we mean that everything that the Pope says is, you know, completely infallible. Um, in fact, if we go back, and, and actually a year with the Post will develop this late, you know, later into the uh, 18th and 19th century, but actually, the the teaching of, of infallibility from the First Vatican Council, which really was a summary of, of what we had believed all along, but that was required at that time in order to limit the authority of the Pope, and, and that might surprise some people because it's like, what? Like, you know, what, what do you mean limit? You're talking about infallibility, but it limited because at that up until that decree, that that clarification, we weren't sure exactly when the Pope was speaking infallible or not. So, for example, when Pope Gregory looks, looked at a steam locomotion, locomotive and, and a train and said, this is, you know, something from the devil. <laughs> People were like, uh, is, is this teaching? Is this his opinion? Is, you know, what, is he joking? Like, so infallibility was actually to provide clarity. So infallibility is when the Pope, guided by the Holy Spirit, united with his brother bishops throughout the world, 
you know, declares and defines some central aspect of our revelation. And, you know, to our non-Catholic friends, I would say, you know, this shouldn't surprise us because a similar gift was given in inerrancy to the authors of the scriptures. So the fact that God can endow a human being with the ability to not speak in error in faith and morals, it isn't completely beyond the idea of understanding in the Christian faith, non-Catholic, Catholic. Infallibility is different from inerrancy, but it's related. So God gives this gift in order that there will be no error in terms of what we know about Jesus Christ in terms of faith and morals. We're talking about Father Jeffrey Kirby. I want to, we're going to dig a little bit further into that when we come back, and then we'll really get into the book. Um, but Father Kirby, how can the, what is the title of the book? Where can they get the book? Yeah, so Year with the Popes, and it's available through the publisher Tam Books, and also through the uh, EWTN Religious Catalog. Yeah, I love that, and uh, any probably, and I'm sure every Catholic bookstore has them too. This is the Bear Watson Convention. We'll be right back. Schoolofmanliness.com is a place for men of grit and grace to join together, to inspire, to encourage, and to challenge each other to grow in manly virtue. Members receive morning man meditations, a monthly curriculum that is rich with audio, video, and written content, and a trail guide to help you map out your new trajectory. Many of our members lead their sons through this same curriculum. Your membership gives you access to both the Man Cave which is our non-Facebook type community, and the School of Manliness at schoolofmanliness.com. Become a member at schoolofmanliness.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, and you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to let you know that Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak is currently airing on EWTN. We have four seasons with 33 episodes, uh, the last 11 of which were all filmed here in Hawaii where I ride with my uh, band of brothers uh, across the United States, uh, motorcycles, and just kind of wonder what the Lord's going to bring to us every day. Uh, if you want to power watch it, you can go to deepadventure.com and become a member, and we, uh, and we, and we give you access to all of the long ride home uh, tv shows or actually you can go to amazon prime the prime video and watch it there on on your own tv there too so long ride home with bear Wozniak, my sons shane and josh work really hard really diligently to get that that out and uh they've won tally awards for it so it's a great show uh and uh, but we think it's something you can uh, drag your brother-in-law to sit in front of the TV and watch. We've had so many people. I think of Trace Big Guns Chamberlain, who was walking by the TV and saw the show, and now he's uh, after after he's going through his RCIA. He and his wife are going to be entering the church this year. So it's a it's a great evangelistic uh, uh, type of program. We have with us today Father Jeffrey Kirby. So you know, even now in this time, uh, and his new book. I'm sorry, uh, A Year with the Popes. Um, yeah, so even now, right now, we're in a time where there seems to be a lot of confusion, and it's a sort of subject that I'm, I, uh, I'm glad that you're someone who could talk about because I don't. But there seems to be some some things going on in the church that it confuses everybody. How do we clarify that in in terms of of what your your description of what it means, uh, what what papal infallibility means? How do we discern what's being said and what it means 
coming from uh, our pope and the bishops? Yeah, so infallibility is, again, a very refined, uh, very distinct, uh, solemn declaration by a pope. And, and it really is rare in the life of the church. And so when we place infallibility in its context, then we begin to understand that there are other different levels of teaching. You know, so the ordinary magisterium of the church, there could be the Holy Father's theological opinions, uh, or his, uh, you know, his own thoughts on matters pertaining to the world. He also can provide pastoral guidelines and so on. So, and these can err, you know, or, or they can be best intentioned and be proven to not serve the intention that was hoped for, or they could be dated. So sometimes something will be good in one generation, but then, you know, later generations, it's like, okay, that, that's not as helpful now uh, to the life of the church. And so when we see things coming from Rome, especially in, in you know, today's day, we can kind of scratch our heads. Uh, we need to understand these distinctions. Uh, for example, I know a lot of people, a lot of us are still uh, kind of trying to understand the whole blessing of couples in states of sin. So whether it's a gay couple or a couple that's cohabitating or a couple that's divorced and remarried. Like, how, how is this possible? You know, we're being told, well, you know, it's the blessing of a couple. It's not the blessing of the relationship. Uh, I mean, beyond the metaphysical confusion that poses, right? mm -hmm. um, we, we have to realize this is a pastoral guideline. You know, so this is not a changing of, of church teaching. This isn't a redefinition of marriage. This isn't, a, you know, a changing of any of that, right? It's it's a pastoral guideline, and, and I and I want to believe that it is a reflection of the heart of the Holy Father, where He really is trying to build bridges. Um, my own opinion, I, I think it's misplaced. Uh, I think it might, you know, backfire in ways that could not be anticipated. Um, but this is a pastoral guideline, so it can come and it can go, and we see variations of this as well. You know, um, there are times when the Holy Father will give opinions about climate change, not binding. <laughs> right. The Holy Father does not bind in, in these matters. Like he, you know, he, he has competency and faith in morals. He doesn't have competency in the empirical sciences. But it's good to listen to him, to understand what he's saying. We show, you know, a, a, you know, a filial respect to mm -hmm. the Holy Father. But we're completely free to disagree. That, that, that gives, that's a big sigh of relief, I think, for a lot of people. Um, especially the clarity with what you shared it I, I guess the uh, the uh, when, a, when, a, when a pope writes an encyclical letter uh, then that would be considered from the chair of the from the chair of Peter and would be considered is, is that a document that's considered infallible which no, very no, no. yeah okay yeah so that's what we call ordinary magisterium so okay. that can carry the weight of religious assent so we, we should certainly that raises the bar. It's not an interview. It's not his theological opinion. It certainly raises the bar. and It means that we pay attention. But even within, for example, teachings given by encyclicals, there are some matters that the Holy Father would simply be expressing his opinion or heightening awareness of something. So, mm -hmm. for example, climate change. You know, mm -hmm. he has expressed that in encyclicals and apostolic exhortations. And so, again, we, we want to listen. We want to try to understand his argument. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, this cannot be binding on conscience because he has no competency in these matters of, of science. And so, right? how do so, we how do we know when he's speaking? Or when a pope is speaking from that authority, then what is the? Yeah, yeah so the highest authority, so infallibility, he is to tell us. So, in mm. the direction by Vatican One, he is to tell us that he is speaking infallibly. And, and there's a mm. formula: I declare, define, and solemnly proclaim. If mm. you hear that, <laughs> uh, then you know. So, for example. The last time we really saw that was in the mid-1990s, Pope St. John Paul II declared, defined, and solemnly proclaimed that the Church has no authority to ordain women to the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And so, and there was a follow-up question just to clarify to the congregation, well, then the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, is the Holy Father speaking in Fallaby? And the answer was yes, that Beautiful. he had declared that. Yeah. That 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 really give, gives us a big sigh of relief. Now I want to now let's switch back to this your book, which as I said, I wasn't expecting this book. This is really a year with the Pope is really what you mean the popes that we're walking alongside and kind of experiencing what that Pope went through historically. The context of going all the way back to Peter, actually actually, actually all the way back to the Old Testament. I want to tell you something a real beautiful story. My wife and I were in Israel. And uh, she was raised Southern Baptist and became a Catholic convert, and we were in Israel with Father Don Calloway. Oh, uh, yeah. This was before he went through the, the, the um, ZZ Top 
early Greek father <laughs> phase with a long beard. <laughs> but uh, and by the way, we got to surf in Tel Aviv. Cindy and I were surfing in Tel Aviv uh, before he showed up. We got there day oh, early wow. on Chris, day after Christmas, and we paddled in tandem surfing. And I did a lift uh, right there in the middle of all this pack of surfers, and they thought we were kooks because we were on a big old board, two of us together. And uh, we became instant friends with all these surfers. When we, a guy paddled over and said, "Hey, you." Uh, you guys know how to surf? I go, no, this is our first time. And then we caught a wave, and I put her in an overhead lift. And then as we walked to the beach, there was a guy joining down on the beach, coming walking down the beach, and goes, "So you're you Bear Wozniak?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Yeah." I go, "I go." He go, he, he had a picture of us in his surf shop. But it, the reason why is because my good friend Doc Paskowitz, uh, as he, I said, "Do you know Doc Paskowitz?" And he goes, "Yeah, I know Doc Paskowitz. He taught my dad how to surf." So it's a small little tribe, you know. It's a, there's a and there's a history, there's a story there. In the surfing world, but even more so in the church. And so when we went to Israel, my wife had never really had that personal de- deep, deep encounter with the Lord. And she was longing for that, that's, that's, that spiritual consolation, you know, not that she hadn't had times of peace and beauty with the Lord, but you know where she had, and she kept thinking, well, maybe we're in, when we're in, Mar- we're, we're in Mary's house, you know, we're, or maybe it'll be here. Maybe it'll be at the cro- at the cross. But you know where she had an incredible. She can't talk about it, Father. It would be nice wow. if she could, but she can't. She can't get words out. When we were at the primacy of Peter, is yeah. where she experienced uh, this infusion of the Holy Spirit. So tell us about 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 what that means as as we dig into this book. What is it? And we only got a couple minutes, so we might get started and do part two when you come back. But about Peter and upon this rock, what is that? What is that? What is the primacy of Peter? How do we understand what that means? Did Protestants don't understand that? Yes, yes, yes. So first, first, as, as a lead in, uh, I also just had, by the way, a really profound experience at the primacy of Peter Church. And I love the fact that it's one of the few places where you could actually walk up and actually touch the water. Yeah. So you be there right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and think, my goodness, the Lord walked here. He 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 cooked breakfast right there. Right, right? there, yeah. And uh, I mean, it, it's very moving. I, did you I have the instinct there. to dip your rosary in the water there? I did not. Uh, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yeah, you, go back. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll get take a moment. We'll, let's talk story about that. Then we'll dig into the primacy of Peter. Uh, you know, you think about how beautiful that area is, mm. and how peaceful. Yes. And then the, yes. Jesus says, "Okay, now you go. You go out to travel the world. You know, you travel a lot. You don't you love it when you're home?" But yes, these guys say they, this beautiful, tranquil place. And next thing you know, they they leave and never never to return. But yes, um, yes. so, yeah, so I, love, I love Jerusalem. I tell you, but there's something about Galilee. When you go to yes, Galilee, Capernaum. Museum, yeah, that whole part of the Lord's life and everything. I just it was. It was I was surprised. I thought it would be Jerusalem or Calvary, or yeah. you know, and it was very moving in some sense. But again, that that real overshadowing of the Holy Spirit happened at Galilee. It happened yeah. there at the water, you know, and, and where the Lord cooked them breakfast. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like it's like more than once, I think. But you know, the, the thing about it is, uh, I was asking Father Don, what what is your favorite part of Israel? And he said uh, he said the Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee. And so, and I would say if I had a chance to go back and just spend a month. I would try to be on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Where I think where uh, I think that's where the primacy of Peter is. I could, it's it, yeah. you know when you go on a Catholic pilgrimage, it's more like an it's more like an expedition. You know, you, you, you <laughs> don't know. We're talking about Father Jeffrey Kirby, and we're going to talk more about a year with the Pope's his new book, which is by Tan Books. We love the way they publish their books. It just looks like it's an important book, doesn't it? The way it's kind of leather bound and all that. It's so cool. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure and Father Jeffrey Kirby. Announcing Spirit Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. So many people, especially you mama bears, tell us we want more of Bear and Cindy together. Well, we're happy to announce our website, spiritofadventuretv.com, as well as our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure, where you can watch Spirit of Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. Join us where we live in the Hawaiian Islands or where we sail our boat, the Spirit of Adventure, in the Caribbean. Experience both adventure and serenity with us as we share our life together, as well as the joy and the wisdom of our faith. Go to spiritofadventuretv.com to find out more and subscribe on YouTube to Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure. And join us, Spirit of Adventure with Bear and Cindy.
Here is a YouTube video short, which is based on an excerpt from my newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Nice guy versus a good man. Women know that there is a difference between a nice guy and a good man. While the nice guy may be helpful, never offend anyone, and is easy just to be around or in fact even to be pushed around, they also know that when push comes to shove, that they want a man that they can rely on that has backbone, determination, competence, confidence, and grit to better himself and the lives of those around him, and who will do the right thing come hell or high water, no matter the personal sacrifice. Women push the nice guy aside into the friend zone while they wait hoping for someone with manly virtue. Buy 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? at schoolofmanliness.com or wherever books are sold. Mama Bears, get these books into the hands of your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com and subscribe to our weekly email to receive video YouTube links of the Bear Wozniak radio show, as well as the Spirit of Adventure with Bear and Cindy TV show, which, by the way, is filmed in the tropics, as well as our manly evangelistic YouTube shorts. Go to schoolofmanliness.com. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our guest today is Father Jeffrey Kirby. I'm going to remind you to go to deepadventure.com or Bear's School of Manliness and invite the men to come and join the man cave in Bear's School of Manliness. We, we get together about uh, once a month with our Zoom video calls with everyone gathers and we dialogue together about that month's curriculum. We have three years of curriculum on, on manliness and uh, there's, there's video and audio and written content and assess, self-assessment content there that you do individually, but we, ch we go through as a group too. So if you start in year, if you join and you were in year two, month two, you just join us right where we're at. But what's really, really cool, what I really hoped would happen is when you couple that with, with the book 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Uh, a lot of men are, are using the book and the school to lead their sons through this dialogue about what it really means to be a man. And single moms who don't know really uh, how to uh, communicate these things to their sons, they, they, she can give them access to that, to, that, uh, to that content too. We're talking with, so we go, bearschoolofmanliness.com, join us there. We have Father Jeffrey Kirby with us, his new book, A Year, a Year with the Popes. It's really like a journey, like you're walking alongside and seeing the development of the church, the development of doc doctrine, uh, seeing the heart of the popes and where the church was at that time. Um, but I like, I like uh, Father Kirby where, I, uh, you know, when I, I read um, uh, uh, Stephen Ray's book, Crossing the Tiber, my dad, who was a Catholic deacon, sent me that book. I'd had an encounter with Christ, but I had left the church. And in some ways I say the church left me. I was hungry, but there was no one I couldn't get at. I, you know, I couldn't. The church wasn't there with the teaching, or how, somehow I didn't connect with it. But um, but reading the crossing the Tiber uh, and uh, and and seeing the finding the early church fathers. But even many non-Catholics love the early church fathers. And you would think when you get back down to the very trunk of that tree and all the branches with all the different denominations, we would find that common ground. But even there, there's a there's different interpretations. And we need a Peter. We need we need uh, the Peter. Jesus was a carpenter, or he was a builder, a technon. We don't know anything that he built other than that he said, "I will build my church." So you know he had a plan, and he, and and, uh, and 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 a, cent a good central portion of that plan is the role of of Peter. Can can you tell us about the primacy of Peter, and then we'll dig more into the book. Yeah. So if we go all the way to the Old Testament, um, you know, we know that the Old Testament had promises, prophecies, institutions all of which the Messiah, the anointed Savior, when he would come, would fulfill these. In fact, that's how we would know that the Messiah had come and that the person claiming to be Messiah would in fact be Christ, the, the anointed Christ, uh, because he would fulfill these promises, prophecies, and institutions. And, and especially 
the institutions of the kingdom of David. So this was, this was the last prophetic overlay before the coming of the Christ. In fact, many people in King David's time thought that David might actually be, have been the Messiah. David, of course, says no. And like, I love when his men give him the water of Bethlehem. You know, they fight through the Philistines. They get the water of Bethlehem. They bring it to him, and they say, here is the water of your hometown, and, and we give this to you. And David takes the water, and he just pours it out. Isn't that but, gnarly? Isn't that gnarly? Yeah, that he, and, and they were thirsty. They were battling. They, yeah, need, you know? Yes. yes. And he says, basically, I, I'm not God, and I'm not the one, right? He's like, wow. I, I'm, not, I'm not this Messiah. Yeah. But, but just to show David's gra- you know, grandeur and, and that prophetic overlay that he gave us. And so all these institutions, the prophecies, the promises, they had to be fulfilled. And, and one of those institutions was the key bearer. And, and we hear about this especially in, in the prophet Isaiah. And the key bearer, he held the key, and, and we're told you know, that the key was huge because to open the door and it was actually, it actually had to rest on the shoulder of the key bearer. But because the holder of the keys could determine who came in and who left the holy city, who had access to the king, he was kind of like, a, we would say now, like a, a prime minister. And that was an institution of the Davidic kingdom. It's one of the prophetic institutions. And so when the Christ would come, he would have to fulfill that. Now, this is very important, Bear, because if someone were to say, Jesus of Nazareth is Christ, is Lord, he is the Messiah, but he didn't give us a key bearer, there would be something missing because mm. he would not have fulfilled all of the prophecies and institutions of the Old Testament. Mm. So all these things had to be done in order for us to know, yes, Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. This is the long-awaited Messiah. And so again, this key bearer, what we now call the papacy, this is placed in context, especially in Matthew chapter 16, when the Lord takes his apostles to the far north, Caesarea Philippi, way beyond their comfort zone, and asks the first question, well, who people say that I am? That's, that's a safe question, right? And then the second, more pressing question, who do you say that I am? Mm-hmm. Apostles are silent. And it is, Christ, it is a Peter who, who stands up, who, who shows himself to be chief apostle, and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this is where Peter, the Lord says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and earth. Now, if we don't know the Old Testament context, we have no idea what the Lord's talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, we don't. Most people don't, actually. Yeah. Right. Like, what are these keys? What is he talking about? What's, what's the context, right? But once we understand the Old Testament, especially that, you know, that overlay from the kingdom of David, then we understand, oh, Jesus is fulfilling all the institutions, promises, and prophecies of the Old Testament. And, of course, we see this throughout his life in every area. So we can say definitively, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And, and so this office that he's given to us as key bearer, this prime minister, continues to guide the church as vicar of Christ, ambassador of Christ, successor of St. Peter, you know, the, the chief shepherd uh, of the church, the supreme pontiff, the high priest of the church, and it continues to be the voice echoing the truths of faith to the body of believers. And so that's why as baptized Christians, we should have a great affection for the Pope. I, I, I love, in Acts of the Apostles, we're told that the early Christians would lie in the streets. As Peter was coming back from prayer, they wouldn't disturb him because he was about the Lord's business. But they lined the streets with the hope that his shadow would fall upon them because the man's shadow had the power to heal the sick. Right? Mm, <laughs> so mm. It shows the authority given to this this office uh, mm. and to the man who holds it. And so, you know, as Christians, even as we perhaps struggle to understand decisions or, or, or pastoral guidelines or various other things, uh, as Christians, we should have a great love and affection for the successor of St. Peter, for, for the Pope in our midst. You know, and, and so t- tell us about, you know, I, I have a really cool key. I don't know if you know about this, but I have this red key that I attached to my golf bag and I earned it by having the worst score at a golf tournament <laughs> and it gives me access to the ladies tee anytime anywhere <laughs> in the world I want to hit from the ladies tee <laughs> but so tell us I'm going to ask you one more question about that then uh, uh, so and, and then and then the matter of apostolic succession I mean when I'm with a priest when I'm with a bishop uh, you know, and, and certainly have, I, I got to be in the presence of the Pope once. Uh, uh, it's something very, very special. Uh, but where do we, where do we as Catholics get this, this assume that there's, uh, as you said, the, uh, you know, the successor of Peter? Where, where, how do we, how do we uh, establish that in Scripture or out of Scripture? Yes, yes. So, and I actually put this uh, in, in 
you know, there's the, the, the year with the popes, I, I try to address all these things in, in a, um, a way that gives instruction and, and teaches from the scriptures, but, but also put it in a devotional way. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, how's this going to make me a better disciple? But in answer to your question, I mean, we see in early Acts of the Apostles that the Apostles came together, they called upon the Holy Spirit, they said, you know, that we have to replace the position that was left vacant uh, by Judas. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like oh, Judas died, uh, you know, horrifically took his own life, and so that's it, it's over, it's done, and when we die, it's all over, this, this is the one right. time, right? No, we, we see in early Acts that they're saying, okay, we have to elect a successor uh, to Judas. And what's interesting is, as they're doing this, they're citing the Old Testament, showing that this is actually the fulfillment of prophecy. So they're mm -hmm. quoting the Psalms, saying, you know, let another take his place, yes, yeah. go on. And then they pray, and they, they roll the dice, and then they, they choose uh, the successor of Judas, who is, of course, uh, St. Matthias. And so that's, that's the biblical context in which this succession happens. Of course, then you look at the early church, as you were mentioning, Bear, and it's, and, and it's a given. You know, I mean, before we had a written New Testament, the most important question to the leaders of the church were, who is your teacher? Mm -hmm. You know, you had to have your lineage in place. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, if someone were to ask, you know, like Polycarp, you know, like, uh, you know, who, you know, who is your teacher? He said, oh, well, you know, I, I was taught by Ignatius, who was taught by, you know, John the Apostle, right? You, you guarded that lineage because that's how people could know whether you were a Catholic and Apostolic bishop or whether you were a heretic. So Beautiful. Was, well said. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And that's through the Bishop of Rome as well, that, right. that lineage. The lineage, the lineage is very important. We're talking with Father Jeffrey Kirby in his new book, A Year with the Popes. Uh, it's it's a beautiful book because you're going through. It's 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 one of those books too. You, I love books, don't you? Just the feel yes. of this book is beautiful, um, uh, because you're going through the, the you go through Pete, the life of Peter and then the early church fathers and all the way up to uh, 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 Saint Pope John Paul II, and you're looking at uh, you're looking at things through that through that person's eyes what what was happening in history and then and then the things that he wrote and so it's uh it's a beautiful it's a beautiful journey and in your busy busy day uh it's a new it's, well it, when we're recording this it's rather early in the year um and so if you want to figure out what is my daily meditation going to what am i going to add to my my uh my prayer life today this would be a great book to to do that with we're talking with father jeffrey kirby we will be right back with more of the bear Wozniak adventure People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wastick adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Here is a YouTube video short which is based on an excerpt from my newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Ponder and choose. As you're seeking God's will for your life, jot down your thoughts in a journal and ponder them. Which one of those will cause you to grow in order to become that goal? Saddle up and try to ride through them the same way that a cowboy rides through a herd on his cutting horse and separates the good cattle out from the rest of the herd. Choose the ones that you want and begin to turn them into concrete goals with a course of action, always being sure that they align with each other, like arrows that all aim at the same target. And by the way, no need to waste your time pursuing the trivial. Don't waste your life away. Set your course and set it now and start now.
My newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, has hit the top five in Christian books for a good reason. It's because men are searching for traction and a trail guide to live out the unique calling and the gifts that they were born with, that each man individually is factory loaded with by God. Paul said, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, do all things in love. Finally, here is a book that talks with men the way men talk with each other. Just plain old straight shoot. By the way, Mama Bears, this is your chance to get this message to your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com or anywhere books are sold. 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Uh, we have with our, us today our guest, Father Jeffrey Kirby. We're talking about his new book, A Year with the Popes. Uh, so, Father, can we go ahead and share with us some of the, some of the, the, you know, as you're writing a book, teachers learn more than their students as they're, as they're developing their subject. Tell us some of the things that, that stand out to you in, in, your, in your new book, A Year with the Popes. Yes, I, 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 it, very much, Bear, like you were saying, um, and being able to do this, it was a labor of love. It was, uh, it was a lot of work. It's probably the most b difficult book I, I've written because it required a lot of research. Because I had ideas of what I wanted in there, especially as we were going through the centuries and, and trying to highlight aspects of the Pope. So, you know, trying to find things like, you know, what, you know, what did the Popes teach during the Black Death? Right? Because right mm. now, COVID, that's still in our minds. Like, you know, well, how did the church respond to the Black Death, that massive plague that, that you know, spread throughout Europe? You know, um, and so how, what was the response there? And, and and what happened during the Avignon Papacy when the popes lived in southern France? Like, what was the situation there? Right. And what was the story behind the Crusades? Like, what, what was that? Really yeah, what was that? that? Yeah, okay. yeah. And so, so just drawing from this, some of us having to do research. Um, you know, luckily, my, my mom lives in Columbia, South Carolina, and the University of South Carolina has a massive library. And so I was able to do a lot of extra research. And, you know, things, for example, like the decree from Pope Pius V, calling all of Christendom to prayer um, during the Battle of Lepanto. So there's a battle, of course, in, you know, off of Greece, where it's between Islamic forces and Christian forces. And, and if the Christian forces had lost, uh, the faith would have been lost in Europe and, and would have been severely damaged throughout the world, right? And, and so it was a massive, you know, uh, a critical point. Um, the Christian forces are greatly outnumbered. The Pope calls all of Christendom to pray the rosary. Well, just trying to find that decree in English. Oh, really? Was, Wow, oh, it was quite the search, and wow. you know, I, I was able to get it. And then I was—I I didn't realize this. Um, this was a few decades after the Protestant Reformation, and when Pope Pius V called all Christians to pray the Rosary, he prayed all for all Christians. Right, right. It was it wasn't just like the, the Catholics. He was calling all Christians to turn to Our Lady to ask for victory, and, and Our Lady was hailed as Our Lady Queen of Victory. And so, you know, it was just the, those type of things where it's like researching and making sure I want us to hear from the Pope himself. What does he say? Not a commentary, not a summary. What, what does he say? And just going through all those things were, were really helpful. And in terms of like personal enrichment, and there are countless examples, but one that really stood out for me was uh, Pope Pius X. And, and I have to tell you, Bear, like, because he's been associated with some of the more radical fringe elements of the church, I, I've always kind of just, I don't know, just I, without even thinking about it, just kind of avoided him because his name's been associated with the, you know, these groups. But re researching about him, I realized, and this is just shocking, you don't bear that Pope Pius X is the only parish priest, the only pastor of a parish to ever be elected Pope? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to now, go. Yeah, no, the parishes, as we understand them, were really created by the Council of Trent. But many popes have served in parishes, like our beloved John Paul II was an associate pastor, a big parochial vicar in a parish, but he was never pastor. Pius X is the only pastor of a parish to ever be elected pope, you know. 
And I just huh. found it very endearing. I thought, oh, okay, yeah. like so he he knows what it's like to worry about, you know, <laughs> yeah. is the roof leaking, and you know, are, are the parish leaders, you know, doing the right thing? And or do you, you have know, leaders? <laughs> you know, yeah, right, 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 developing right. leaders, yeah, yes, you know, and and that's one of the reasons why when he became pope, he was so committed to the Catholic apostolate. You know, that was a big move to get you know Christians, Catholics involved in in ministry. Well, that because, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, he was yes. in the grassroots. He, you know. And his his motto was to restore all things in Christ, and for a long time he was the only contemporary pope canonized because he was so beloved, hmm. uh, beloved by uh, by the people of God because he he had a pastor's heart. And I'm reading his stuff where he's denouncing modernism, mm -hmm. and at first I was kind of like was like oh, okay this is kind of you know interest you know just, I'll keep my distance like this you know seems kind of like. You know, just kind of like more on fringe things, but I'm reading his denunciations of monitors, and I'm thinking, this guy is spot on. He nailed it, and he nailed it. It's almost prophetic. Yes, you know? yes, yes. In fact, Bear, I'll tell you, like full disclosure, it was an examination of conscience for me because mm -hmm. there were some things in there I thought, have I fallen into that? You know, mm -hmm. there's just like subjectivizing of the faith. Everything is about mm -hmm. my experience, my feelings, and you know, everything becomes you know basically man-made man remade and uh and I, I just found that very powerful again a, a type of examination of conscience so he was powerful um benedict the 15th who was the pope from world war one um he he was great i mean i had never really read anything that he had written i, I read about him but then i'm reading his stuff you know because we forget that world war one we still had christian nations right and these Christian nations that were engaging in this what called the Great War, now called World War One, and the Pope is just, I mean, he is just laying into them, you are Christian, you are not just supposed to be doing this, uh, trying to be a real advocate of peace. So that was uh, a pretty uh, moving and, and powerful. And then uh, lastly, I'll just say, um, I was really uh, inspired as well by the example of Pope Pius XII. Uh, his story has not been told. Uh, he A remarkable life and a real legacy of teachings that I think have been really eclipsed by a lot of, um, you know, uh, falsities about him in terms of, you know, the, the, the quote, Hitler Pope and all these types of lies, yeah. you know. Uh, but, I mean, we have, we have a remarkable family there. I mean, there's ups and downs. We've had some bad posts, but we've had some really amazing saints, mystics, and spiritual masters on the throne of Peter. But that, and that goes back to, you know, like we were saying earlier, there's been some bad, bad popes. Uh, and that goes back to that teaching that that uh, of uh, uh, that doesn't. But the, but fortunately, none, 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 not fortunately, but because Jesus is the the builder of the church, they never spoke with that authority. Uh, uh, you know, false teaching. Even though they even though they had false teaching. You know, we had so yeah. so many so many. Uh, and what I love about it too is it shows uh, that the, if you read the Old Testament, there's a lot of there's a lot of. Uh, bad characters in there a lot of bad actors there's murderers you know moses david you know yeah, yeah, i mean yeah. and so it shows it just shows that that you know um it it shows the the it shows that the book isn't is real because it's not making all these heroes to be just uh perfect you know but you know, one of the things I, this is just a thought comes to me i remember once father i read the new testament and then the old testament and then the new testament again all in about a six-week period of time i just had wow. six weeks i had a six-week period where I could just devote, I sat at the beach and read. And one of the things that I struck me as I was reading through the Old Testament, I know this isn't 100% true and I'm not a theologian, but one of the things I discovered is it seemed like normally when the king's mother was devoted to the Lord, the king was too. And uh, mm -hmm. interesting, uh, and I think I think that's a lesson for us too as far as as far as far uh, our relationship with our, uh, with Mary. You know, as, talk, talk to us a little bit about that and the papal, the papal, how the, how the teaching on Mary came to be, and, and then the, the 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 I don't know if you called it encyclical, but the official pro proclamation about her. Right. Can you tell us about that in these last couple of minutes? Absolutely, I'll say this: we've never had a bad pope that was devoted to Our Lady. <laughs> wow! So you imagine we've had two hundred and sixty-six popes, and it could be argued that we've had maybe ten or fewer bad popes. And, and none of those bad popes were ever devoted to Our Lady. We, we see no massive teaching or devotion to Our Lady. Meanwhile, the men who were spiritual masters and mystics and voices of the supernatural, uh, signs and wonders in our midst who were popes, 
uh, were all immensely devoted to Our Lady. Like, for example, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. I mean, he probably is the one who has written the most about Our Lady, and he was a he was a pope at a pivotal time. Like, the the Church had lost all its voice. The Enlightenment led to revolutions. Revolutions led to attacks of the Church. The Church, in many respects, imploded. Uh, the papal states were lost. Uh, pope Leo was considered a, a prisoner of the Vatican. Mm-hmm. He took Leo in honor of Leo the Great because oh. he considered fighting barbarians. Right. You know. And yet, in the midst of wow, this, wow, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, that's wow. Yeah, yeah, and, and I put that in the book too, where he t- explains why he chose Leo. <laughs> you know. So, and uh, and we we see this great servant and 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 you know beloved son of Our Lady. Um, so definitely there, and of course, Pius the Ninth who declared the Immaculate Conception, Pius the Twelfth who declared the Assumption. So beautiful. And I, I mentioned Pope Pius the Fifth with the Battle of Lepanto. So uh, I tried to present different teachings uh, from the different popes about Our Lady, and of course, some of them go all the way back to the early Church. Like I, I quote the Council of Ephesus, you know, and, mm. and the Pope the bishops there when they first declared. Our Lady, the the, the God Bearer, the, the Mother of God. Yes. Uh, Our Lady's there. I mean, she's always a part. She's Mother of the Church, and and I definitely wanted to make sure her presence was felt in the book. Yeah. Well, you did a great job. I'm looking forward to this this my year with the popes. I'm on page uh, 57, I think, right now. We've been talking with Father. Yeah, it's one page per per meditation. Uh, with the book, a year with the popes. Where you go alongside the popes learn what they were experiencing at the time and what their wisdom was for us at the time. Father Kirby, uh, thanks so much for joining us on the Bear Wozniak adventure. You know, here, yes. in Ho- here in Hawaii, we have a saying, aloha. And ha means breath. So when God breathed into Adam and Eve, uh, that or breathed into Adam, that life-giving soul, um, he aloha him. Oh, and wow. uh, and uh, Jesus said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. And he breathed his Holy Spirit on his disciples. So may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell. Thank you.